On May 18, 1980, a catastrophic event occurred that has been called God's Gift to Creationists. On a beautiful Sunday morning at 8.32 a.m., Mount St. Helens erupted and caused the largest landslide in modern human history. Then, for nine hours, it released the explosive power of one atomic bomb every second. Not only was the world shocked by the eruption's explosive power, but it also challenged the way that secular scientists think how catastrophes have changed this Earth. Never did creation scientists have such a wonderful observable laboratory to help explain so many other geologic features around the world by catastrophic processes. It doesn't take millions of years to form canyons, stratified layers, and petrified forest. Only days, weeks, and months. All this and more next on Awesome Science. Awesome Science takes you on a field trip to some of the most amazing geologic and historical sites around the world, where we use the Bible as our history guidebook to interpret what we see, that the Bible can be trusted, and empirical science falls in line with the biblical account of creation, the fall, and the flood. Science, it's awesome. Pacific Northwest in the United States is an amazing collection of pristine coastland, lush valley farmland, high desert, and the Cascade Range. The Cascade Range stretches from Northern California to Southern British Columbia. The range was pushed up during the later stages of the flood. The range contains about a dozen volcanic peaks, averaging at around 10,000 feet. Most of the peaks are thought to have been formed not long after the flood, when the Earth was still equalizing from the massive tectonic shifting. Eventually, much of this volcanic activity slowed down in about 500 years, but a few volcanoes remained active or went dormant. The recent increase in population centers around these peaks has drawn concern from scientists. The 14,400-foot dormant Mount Rainier poses a huge threat of catastrophic destruction if it let loose. Another dormant volcanic peak was Mount St. Helens in southern Washington state. This area was a pristine scenic wonderland with tall beautiful virgin forest and deep blue mountain lakes. Youth camps and mountain cabins lined the shores of Spirit Lake and the Toodle River north of the mountain. For decades, brave mountaineers would climb the 9,677-foot-tall summit for a spectacular view. But in March 1980, the mountain started to awaken. At first, small earthquakes began to rattle the countryside. Over the next 60 days, there were over 12,000 earthquakes, each increasing in size. Scientists knew that the sleeping giant was about to wake up. Then, in early April, the first steam explosion penetrated the summit, and a big hole appeared in the snow. As earthquakes slowly increased, scientists believed that magma was working its way up towards the surface. In early May, a bulge began to appear on the north side of the mountain. It was estimated to be growing at five feet a day. Like a giant balloon, the pressure was growing, and the danger level of a large-scale eruption appeared to be imminent. On the morning of May 18, 1980, at 8.32 a.m., an earthquake at 5.1 on the Richter scale signaled the eruption. This earthquake caused a giant landslide as one half of a cubic mile of summit slid north into the valley below, creating 25 square miles of new landscape. The avalanche contained rock, snow, and glaciers. When the landslide slid off of Mount St. Helens, three-fourths of it went into the Toodle River Valley, raising the valley floor by hundreds of feet. As the landslide came into the valley, huge chunks of the mountain stayed intact. We call these hummocks. One quarter of the landslide traveled northeast and spilled into Spirit Lake, causing an 860-foot tidal wave across the water, washing up onto the opposite hillside and totally destroying the old growth forest there. 
The new landslide material also permanently raised the level of the lake more than 200 feet above the pre-eruption level. The landslide contained 13 glaciers from the top of the mountain. These glaciers were buried in the landslide, eventually covered in ash. After this 1,300 feet of mountain disappeared into the landslide, a massive steam explosion came, spreading across the landscape to the north. This steam explosion went lateral and leveled 150 square miles, causing the old growth forest to look like toothpicks laying on top of each other. Usually, when a mountain erupts, the explosion goes straight up. But Mount St. Helens did something different. The first explosion went straight out to the north. Having seen this kind of blast for the first time, scientists were now able to find 300 volcanoes around the Earth that they were now able to explain using observations from Mount St. Helens. For the next nine hours, the mountain released the equivalent of 40 million tons of TNT blast energy. That's equivalent to 33,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs, or one atomic bomb a second. Seeing the amazing eruption reminds us of God's power. In Psalms 104, verse 32, God says, Who looks on the earth and it trembles? Who touches the mountains and they smoke? It just takes God's little finger touching the earth, and incredible power and destruction are released at his command. The ash and pumice cloud spread across the eastern part of Washington state. Cities like Yakima were turned from day to night in a matter of hours. As the buried glaciers in the landslide debris heated up, they eventually exploded, causing large pits in the landslide material. All of the melted snow and ice caused a mud flow down the Toodle River. The mud flow carried ash, pumice, and rocks tens of miles down the valley, all the way to the Columbia River. Shipping lanes were shut down because of the debris clogging up the river. Down the Toodle River Valley, bridges were totally gone. Logging camps were destroyed. Houses were washed away. The devastation was massive. But the events at Mount St. Helens were small compared to an average volcanic eruption. In past eruptions, the volcanic activity at Yellowstone was much larger. One of these eruptions at Yellowstone is estimated to have been 2,500 times larger in its destructive force. The next day, there were 57 people dead, and the devastation was beyond description. In recent memory, no one had ever seen such catastrophic destruction. President Carter flew over the area a few days after May 18th and described the blast zone as looking like the surface of the moon. But in the destruction came a blessing for creation scientists. As it began to be studied, it revealed how many geologic features around the world that could have happened as the result of major catastrophes, in particular, the global flood. The Cascade Range has a variety of volcanic peaks. Some have gone dormant, others have gone extinct, and some are still active. Crater Lake in Southern Oregon is the remnant of Mount Mazama, which exploded a few thousand years ago, and its ash can be found all around the Pacific Northwest. Another imploded mountain is at Newbury Crater in Central Oregon, and like Yellowstone, it is considered active because of its hot springs. On the south side of Mount St. Helens, great ancient lava flows can be seen at the Timberline level. I would encourage you to visit this area and tour some great geologic formations. Most volcanoes have lava caves. Up here at Mount St. Helens is Ape Cave. It's one of the longest lava caves in the world at almost 12,000 feet. Let's go exploring. Got our lantern, the bat food, and a couple flashlights. Well, let's go. Yeah. The origin of the name for Ape Cave is somewhat unclear, but some think it goes back to the alleged Bigfoot sightings in the area back in 1924 where a big ape was seen. Others say it's due to the foresters and loggers from many years ago who were referred to as brush apes. 
Another group says it was named after a Boy Scout troop called the Apes back in the 1950s. This lava cave was formed when the lava flow cooled on the top, but the hot lava still ran underneath. Eventually, it got lower and lower and left the cave altogether. This type of cave formation can be seen at active volcanoes like Kilauea in Hawaii. Hot lava flows through a trough. The top of the trough cools because it's closest to the surface, but the rest of the lava keeps flowing. The top hardens and a lava tube forms. Eventually, the lava stops flowing and a cave is left. The Upper Ape Cave is around one and a half miles long and climbs up 400 feet where cavers hike over 27 boulder piles and scale an eight foot high lava fall. This tunnel is about 2,000 years old, but around 500 years ago, a mud flow came through here and laid down a new floor. Researchers think it is unusual for Mount St. Helens to have produced a lava tube like this one because the mountain usually produced much thicker lava with potentially explosive eruptions like the 1980 blast. But this lava tube does exist and its features are good confirmation of the power and awesomeness of God. The lava tube also helps us understand the formation of Mount St. Helens right after the flood. If this lava tube had been around for millions of years, it would have eroded away or collapsed long ago. Because it's so close to the surface and the tremendous amounts of water seep in through cracks above. It's pretty amazing to think you can hike down the same path that lava once flowed. Now this is a place where you can explore and see God's handiwork. The eruption on May 18, 1980 at Mount St. Helens was impressive. When the north side of the mountain slid into the valley below, it created a gold mine of research material for creation scientists like Dr. Steve Austin, who studied many of these formations. The valley below was covered with 600 feet of landslide deposits. The nine hour eruption laid huge deposits of ash and pumice on top of the landslide, but the mountain was not done yet. On June 12th, not more than a month later, another major eruption put an additional 25 feet of deposits on Earth's newest landscape. For almost two years, the mountain went quiet. Then, in March 1982, there was another major eruption, which melted ice and snow that had collected in the crater. Large amounts of water mixed with the ash and pumice this lahar, or mud flow, came down off the mountain and laid another layer on top of the past layers. The strata, layers of deposits, were forming quickly. As the mud flow reached the north side of the blast zone, the water came to an obstacle and began to pool. The dammed water eventually eroded through the obstruction and carved some amazing canyons on the valley floor. As they looked at the layers in the canyon walls, they saw what could have been interpreted as individual volcanic events based on the way the layers appeared. Scientists call this building a sequence. Secular scientists have held that geologic layers take long ages to form because they hold to the idea of uniformitarianism, which means little change over a long period of time. But here at Mount St. Helens, these layers formed in a matter of hours, and there was direct observation to their formation. For example, the 25-foot June 12th layer was formed in just three hours. The layer was formed when the mountain erupted and the hot pyroclastic flow rushed down the northern flanks of the mountain at an amazing speed. Because of the erosion, we can see this layering in the canyon walls today. If one were to explore these canyons, they would have no idea how quickly these layers were formed. A uniformitarian scientist might have guessed that there were many eruptions over long ages because that's the main idea which has been taught over the last 100 years. And the layers look similar to the rock layers they assume took long ages to form. Catastrophism is roughly the opposite of uniformitarianism and was considered dead by the secular scientific community. This was mainly because it was too closely tied to Noah's flood, a major catastrophe, and long ages was a proven fact. Not so. If secular scientists admitted to the global flood of Genesis, then that would mean that God is alive and his judgment is sure. Why would men who had rebellion in their hearts want to admit this? 
They wouldn't. So the idea of uniformitarianism has dominated the study of geology for the past 150 years, as God's word has been rejected. As scientists looked closer at the June 12th layer, they discovered fine and coarse materials had been laid down as separate layers called lamina. What was amazing was these lamina had been formed in the pyroclastic flow in winds moving over 100 miles per hour. It would be logical to assume that catastrophic processes would just mix up all the material into one big homogenized deposit with no distinct layers. But here at Mount St. Helens, just the opposite has been observed. In these layers, there is a feature called micro-thin lamination, where there are coarse and fine layers just centimeters from each other. This amount of detail is remarkable because it has been proposed by secular scientists that features like these take long ages to form, not minutes or seconds. Yet, this is what has been observed to have happened at Mount St. Helens. In other canyons across the earth, we can observe many similar features, such as in the lower sandstone layers at the Grand Canyon. Secular scientists have proposed that all sedimentary layers in the Grand Canyon were formed by seas coming and going over millions of years. As the seas persisted, sediments from the waters made the layers as particles settled out of the water. Eventually, the seas left and the land was pushed up to its current elevation. There are many evidences that we can look at to show that these layers were not made by seas over millions of years. Indications are that these layers were formed very quickly by water during the year of Noah's flood. As the flood waters moved around the earth, large amounts of sediment settled out, forming layers of sediment. When the flood waters were receding, they continued to dump sediments on the landscape in very short order. With the observable evidence left after the eruption of Mount St. Helens, we now realize how quickly fine and coarse layers can form, given the right conditions. It doesn't take millions of years to form these types of layers, just the right catastrophic conditions, such as what we would expect during the flood. Mount St. Helens provides a miniature laboratory for the study of particle stratification. As the landslide fell into the Toodle River Valley, over 25 square miles of new landscape was developed some places up to 600 feet thick. On top of the debris field, layers of ash and pumice were deposited. The lush valley became a gray wasteland, similar to the moon. After the major volcanic activity in 1980, the mountain went quiet for a couple of years. During this time, snow and ice accumulated in the crater. Then, in March of 1982, the mountain came alive again. The large amount of snow and ice melted in the crater and broke through the fresh landscape. It carved two huge canyons, Lewitt Canyon and Step Canyon, with depths up to 600 feet. Not only did it erode through the ash deposits, but also through 100 feet of solid rock from lava flows thought to be about 500 years old. The water then came cascading down the flanks of the mountain and into the valley. When it reached a large pit left from a glacier steam explosion, the water pooled and was dammed up to a depth of 125 feet across the valley floor. The mud flow eventually broke through the dam and kept flowing to the west down the Toodle River Valley, carving canyons as it went. What the mud flow left behind stunned scientists around the world. Just like a dam you might build at the beach, when a dam breaks through soft soil, like sand or ash, the water carves through these materials very quickly, leaving canyons and channels. As scientists went into these canyons, they studied the newly formed strata and were amazed. The forces of erosion carved a series of canyons up to 140 feet deep, all in just hours. One formation has been called the Little Grand Canyon because of its similar features. It is about a 140th scale model of the Grand Canyon. Secular scientists point to the canyons around the world, like the Grand Canyon and Zion Canyon, and say that the small rivers in the bottoms of these canyons carved what we see today over millions of years.
there are many reasons to suggest this is just not the case. A proper understanding of the evidence after actual observation of rapid canyon formation at Mount St. Helens led many researchers to conclude that to carve canyons of large magnitude, you need a lot of water in a short period of time, not the small rivers over millions of years. Contrary to what most scientists think, it isn't the river that carved the canyon. It was the canyon that formed and provided a passageway for the river to flow through. If one were to walk through this canyon using the uniformitarian model of long ages, they would imagine it took tens of thousands to millions of years for the North Fork of the Tootle River to carve this canyon. Yet, we know from eyewitness accounts that it happened very rapidly. We don't have direct eyewitness accounts to how the canyons around the world were formed. But we have the Bible, God's eyewitness testimony, that gives us a framework by which we can look at these other canyons and features. The biblical record and subsequent models, based on what we have observed from events we did witness, are the key to understanding these other canyons. Here at Mount St. Helens, we were able to see the landscape before these canyons were here, and we know the events and mechanisms which laid down the strata and carved the canyon through them. Because of the events at Mount St. Helens, even many secular geologists are junking the idea of millions of years for the formation of the Grand Canyon and are thinking in terms of catastrophe. But what type of catastrophe would have cut the Grand Canyon and other canyons around the world? You would have needed a lot of water over a short period of time. There's only one event recorded in human history that is the key to accomplish this the flood of Noah's day as recorded in the Bible. There are a number of ideas of where the water came from to carve the Grand Canyon. Some creationists have developed the idea of two great lakes behind the Kaibab Plateau. This dam formed by the plateau was breached and eroded the canyon in a matter of days as the lakes drained rapidly. These lakes would have been left from the receding floodwaters as valleys and plateaus quickly rose at the end of the flood, trapping the water in these huge lakes. Other creation scientists have suggested the Grand Canyon and many other canyons around the world were formed when the floodwaters were receding across the land, cutting huge gaps in the landscape. Whatever the mechanism, we know they were the result of catastrophe and not slow processes. Using Mount St. Helens as a laboratory for studying catastrophic processes helps us realize the incredible impact the flood had on forming the features we see on this earth today. Just to the south of Mount St. Helens is a fascinating feature called the Trail of Two Forests. Around 2,000 years ago, when the lava flow came through here, there was a tree standing right in this exact place. As the lava flowed around it, it hardened enough against the cool wood to make a form right there. And then the wood vaporized through the heat and whatever was left just rotted away, leaving a hole. Since that time, a new forest has grown on top of the lava flow. Hence, the Trail of Two Forests. An easy to use walkway has been built for us to see this great volcanic feature. Not all of the trees were upright. Some of them fell down and created these lateral tunnels all across the area. Who wants to see me go down one of these right now? Show of hands, anyone? Yeah! All right, your vote wins. Here I go. Are you certain my insurance covers this? Oh well. Wow. <laughs> that was cool. Science, it's awesome. When Mount St. Helens erupted on May 18, 1980, the largest landslide in recorded history slid down the mountain and into the valley below. One fourth of the landslide barreled into Spirit Lake, causing an 860 foot tidal wave. That wave washed up onto the surrounding hills and into the old growth forest. When the water came washing back into the lake, it pulled down about one million trees with it. 
The landslide also displaced the lake, so that the present level is 200 feet above the level it was before the eruption. Mountain cabins and lakeside camps were buried in a matter of seconds. As the eruption stopped and scientists were able to go into the blast zone, an amazing sight unfolded. Some first thought that Spirit Lake was gone because they couldn't see it, but it was just covered in logs. As the lake emerged, scientists were excited to know this would be their first chance to study how logs would behave after this catastrophe. What they found would forever change the way they thought about the development of petrified forests. Since 1980, the number of logs on the lake has decreased dramatically. After the eruption, scientists studied how the logs became waterlogged because the root balls at the bottom of the logs were denser. They began to sink first, forcing the logs to stand upright, halfway in the water. As the logs soaked up more and more water, they began to sink to the bottom of the lake. What also became evident was certain species remained floating while others disappeared beneath the waters. After careful study, it was discovered that some tree species, such as noble fir and silver fir, contained less resin. Resin slows the absorption of water, so those logs with more resin would stay afloat longer. The other curious thing about the logs that were still floating was that their bark had been stripped off. Where did the bark go? The only logical explanation is that it went to the bottom of the lake. These processes were new to scientists, so they began to study them in this living laboratory. What excited them the most was how what they found could help them interpret other geologic sites around the world. With many of the logs and all the bark gone from the top of the lake, the real mystery lay below the waters. After getting the right permits, they took a small boat down to Spirit Lake with a sonar towfish. They went back and forth among the giant logs and mapped the bottom of the lake. What they found was amazing. The sonar map showed as many as 10,000 small and large logs standing straight up on the bottom at various levels in the sediments. Then, Dr. Austin did what any good scientist would do, further investigation. He and his team put on scuba gear and dove about 100 feet down. As the sonar map had showed, they found logs standing upright at different levels. Some were planted firmly, others they can move back and forth. They also had root masses at the bottom, but broken off as if they were pulled out of the ground in a catastrophe. Given the right conditions, such as another eruption from Mount St. Helens, these logs could end up completely buried under ash and sediments. If the area was eroded away, it would give the appearance that multiple forests had grown there, one on top of the other, over many years. Dr. Austin began to look at other geologic features to see if they could be explained using Spirit Lake as a model. He turned his attention to Yellowstone's petrified forest at Specimen Ridge. Secular scientists developed the idea that this petrified forest was at least 27 different forests, which grew there over millions of years. A forest would grow, then get destroyed by an eruption. Another forest would grow on top of that, and so on. The time frame to develop all these forests would have been much greater than the biblical time scale of 4,350 years since the flood. So Dr. Austin chose to look at it from a catastrophic model, keeping the global flood in mind, something a secular scientist would never consider. Dr. Austin and his team hypothesized that if this forest was developed the same processes as that at Spirit Lake, there should be very little evidence for multiple forests over long ages. They got permission to dig up some of the root balls of the trees. Just as they suspected, the trees didn't have spreading roots because they didn't grow there. Just like at Spirit Lake, these logs were ripped out in a catastrophe and deposited here. They found several other key factors which determined the trees didn't grow there. The tree rings all matched in size. There was no evidence of burrowing animals and the ash in the soil mostly came from the same eruptions. The petrified forests in Yellowstone were formed by catastrophe in very short order. The park sign, which told of multiple forests over millions of years, was taken down. The uniformitarian explanation of the evidence just doesn't hold up. 
At the beginning of the global flood, as described in the Bible, the rains came down and the fountains of the great deep were opened. It is believed these fountains were subterranean water and volcanic fissures. During the flood, the water pushed across the land, ripping up forest across the landscape. Some of these logs were buried instantly, but many floated to the top of the waters, creating giant floating log mats like those seen at Spirit Lake. In various places around the world, these logs would have begun to sink to the bottom of the waters and buried quickly in the sediments and ash. With the immense pressure from above, the heat from below and the right chemical mixture in the ash, the logs would have petrified quickly. Some secular scientists have told us that it takes long ages to petrify wood, but in reality, it doesn't take that long at all. Experiments have been performed in the lab which found that logs can petrify in less than a year. There's a whole industry which petrifies wood quickly and sells it as flooring in homes. Given the right conditions during the flood, producing a massive petrified forest would have been easy. Events at Spirit Lake have given us a miniature laboratory of scientific study for the way logs get buried in a catastrophe and give us a model for how things could have happened on a much larger scale during the flood. Real science is what we can study and repeat, then use those results to explain all the other features around the world, like at Yellowstone. Real science is good confirmation that the Bible can be trusted as Earth's true history book. Science, it's awesome! The catastrophic events at Mount St. Helens have not only helped explain petrified forests, but also how we got our large coal beds. The coal deposits around the world are amazing. They can be hundreds of feet thick and provide fuel for heating and electricity generation. The layers are usually very glassy and smooth. Secular scientists have developed the idea that these massive coal deposits were formed slowly over millions of years in freshwater swamps. Over long periods, the logs fell from the forests and were buried in the antiseptic waters of the swamp. Over millions of years, a thick spongy layer of broken plant material developed, called peat. This layer of peat eventually got buried by other sediments such as clay, mud, and sand. The peat eventually turned into coal. Sounds like a good story, but there are some challenges with this secular idea. This is especially true when you study the quality of swamp peat and peat beds. Beds of peat can be found around the world. In Nova Scotia, there is a big layer of peat near the coastline. This layer of peat was developed over a few hundred years. Recently, the layer was exposed through erosion. This layer of peat and other swamp deposits shows something very interesting. What we find is that these peats are usually full of roots and the layers are not very smooth. If the present is the key to the past, as secular scientists believe, then there is a major problem. When we go to the great coal beds of the world, they are very smooth and glassy and absent of roots. Such evidence simply remains without a good explanation in the secular view. But in a biblical view, there is no problem. These layers were made mainly from tree bark in a catastrophe, not swamp materials. Because of the size of the beds and the materials that they were made from, it would have required massive amounts of organic life to create and must have been deposited and buried quickly. The events at Mount St. Helens and the record of a biblical flood could give us the answer to how these massive coal beds were formed. When the trees were uprooted during the eruption at Mount St. Helens, then deposited as logs on Spirit Lake. It didn't take long for those logs to rub together and scratch most of the bark from them. When Dr. Austin and his team dove into the lake, they found about three feet of bark peat on the bottom of the lake from the logs above. If there were ongoing eruptions at Mount St. Helens, the peat could be catastrophically buried in ash and other sediments. That would make this layer of peat a candidate to be turned to coal. As described earlier, the flood would have ripped up much of the vegetation as the waters prevailed on the land. Because of wave action and winds, this vegetation is thought to have clumped together on the surface, creating giant floating log mats. 
Just like at Spirit Lake, the logs would have rubbed together and the bark would have fallen off, then sunk to the bottom of the sea to form a layer of peat. The logs at Spirit Lake only produced three feet of peat. With the immense amount of coal we find today, there would have been a lot more vegetation floating on the water, which is what we would expect during the flood. After much of the peat was deposited, the subsequent floodwaters would have laid sediments on top of it, applying pressure to the peat and making coal in very short order. The type of coal we find in the giant coal beds is very smooth and glassy, and by natural means can really only be formed by rapidly laying down tree bark underwater. If the giant coal beds were laid down from swamp action over millions of years, the coal should have been full of roots from the trees and plants growing above the covered swamp. But the roots just aren't there. Does coal take long ages to form? No, it doesn't. Labs today are making coal in just a few weeks. So it doesn't take long ages, like secular scientists propose. All you need is the right catastrophic conditions. Using Mount St. Helens as our miniature laboratory, the Bible as our history book and ultimate authority, and the flood as the catastrophic process, the giant coal beds can be easily explained using this floating log mat model, and God's word is the key to unlocking the mystery. After the May 18, 1980 eruption, the blast zone north of the mountain was a wasteland. In one minute, the virgin forests and pristine lakes were transformed into a gray, desolate landscape. The landslide deposit covered the valley floor up to 600 feet. Then it was buried in thick layers of ash, pumice, and mud flow. It was a new landscape, and scientists were very interested to see how long it would take for life to return. In the surrounding mountains, trees were knocked down and all small vegetation was obliterated. Any wildlife in the area was vaporized in the steam explosion. It is estimated that 1,500 elk were killed, 11 million fish, 1 million birds, 5,000 deer, and 200 black bears. Much of Spirit Lake was considered a toxic brew of volcanic gases seeping up from the lake bed. Because of all the organic material now in the lake, it became a hydrogen bubble, stinking of methane. Almost all of the oxygen in the water was depleted. The temperature of the water had risen 20 degrees Celsius. Legionella, which causes Legion Air's disease, was also found in the lake. Very little could live there, except for bacteria and a little bit of plankton. It was quite a mess. At first glance, every living thing had been destroyed. Many scientists thought it would take hundreds of years for life to return. But because of God's amazing design in nature, life returned much sooner than they expected. The lumber companies decided to replant their sections of land with new trees. But the Forest Service decided to let their land grow back on its own. It became a living laboratory on biological recovery after a natural disaster. Because it was spring when the mountain had erupted, there was still snow on the ground. Many animals were still in hibernation, and baby trees were hiding under the snow. As spring turned into summer, the pocket gophers came to life, breaking up the soil and spreading seeds into the blast zone. Elk would eat plants outside the blast zone, come in, and leave their scat on the ground. The seeds in the scat would start growing as plants. In the same way, birds also carried seeds in. But much of the soil was heavy in nitrogen because of the ash. Most plants don't grow well in nitrogen-rich soils, but some plants do. Lupine began growing like crazy across the landscape. Lupine is able to eat up the nitrogen and develop the soil into a more friendly place for larger plants. Eventually, alders and conifers began to grow. Since 1980, a young forest has grown up in the blast zone. In Spirit Lake, the bacteria went to work, eating up all those toxic chemicals. The algae put oxygen back in the water. Within five years, the lake was back to its original pristine condition. Fish were found in the lake again. Some could have stayed in side streams, but a majority of the comeback was due to fishermen reintroducing trout into the lake. Within a few years after the introduction, 
It was known that some fish were reaching lengths of 25 inches, much due to the good nutrients provided by the ash and sediments from the eruption. The wildlife has returned to. There are now between 2,000 and 3,000 elk living in the blast zone, almost double of what there was before. Birds and small animals have also come back in great numbers. The spider population has also flourished. With a large open area, they have been able to float in on air currents unhindered. It's estimated that 2 million spiders land on one square mile of land in the blast zone every day. Why is this fast recovery so important to those of us who believe that the Bible is God's history book? First of all, God has designed our earth to recover from catastrophe much quicker than secular scientists used to believe. But we know this fact because God is good and a good designer of our planet. He may use his finger and make the mountain smoke, but he also desires that there be a quick restoration of what has been destroyed. We see the goodness of God even in this sin-cursed and broken world. The recovery at Mount St. Helens gives us a glimpse into the quick recovery of our planet after the global flood. The global flood was designed to destroy most everything. Some sea life still survived, but much of it died as well. Because it was God's judgment for man's rebellion, only those aboard the ark, Noah and his family, and all the land-dwelling, air-breathing animals were saved. Just like Mount St. Helens, the destruction of the landscapes during the flood was complete and quick. The Bible tells us that by day 150, the flood had covered the highest elevation on the earth and then began to recede. Just over a year after boarding the ark, Noah and the animals walked on to dry land. It was important that there be enough vegetation and food for the animals to survive on the earth's new surface. We know that Noah sent out a dove, and that dove came back with an olive leaf, showing that vegetation was already recovering on the planet. We can see at Mount St. Helens a miniature laboratory for quick recovery from a catastrophe. And we can apply what we've learned here to see that a quick recovery after the flood is possible. The recovery of an ecosystem is very complicated. Here at Mount St. Helens, we see God's design and intellect in how he created soils, plants, and animals to reclaim the landscape quickly. If given simply to chance processes without God's design in nature, the recovery would have been impossible. There was definite order to this biological recovery at Mount St. Helens, and it should draw us to praise God for his incredible design. Mount St. Helens teaches us many things about catastrophic processes, recovery, and even a bit about God's character. We know that 57 people died in the eruption, yet every one of them was warned about the coming danger. In the same way, the Word of God says that there is another coming worldwide destruction, this time by fire. All of us have been warned to get out of harm's way by repenting of our sins and coming into salvation through God's Son, Jesus Christ. We have also learned that geological processes thought by secular scientists to take millions of years can happen much quicker given the right conditions. The global flood as recorded in the Bible provides many of the right conditions for geologic processes around the world to produce these features in very short periods of time. It doesn't take millions of years to form canyons, stratified layers, and petrified forest only days, weeks, and months. Secular scientists have their own ideas about how the Earth was formed over billions of years, but they leave out God's supernatural touch and judgment. Many of the evidences they use to support evolutionary ideas are better interpreted when looking at them through the truth of Scripture. Mount St. Helens was truly God's gift to creationists by showing us catastrophic processes that occurred during and after the flood. 4,300 years ago. Science, it's awesome.